Thank you, Doug. That was a terrific start to our conference and really framed the issues quite well. Um, again, we'll be having a panel after the break for all this, where most of the speakers will be present uh, to answer questions with us collectively. Um, the reason why I said most is our next speaker, Art Kaplan, um, actually has to leave immediately for the airport right after his talk. So we've been doing some negotiation, and he's going to speak a little more briefly. Um, so there will be some time at the end of his talk uh, four questions before our break at 10 o'clock. But let me introduce uh, Art briefly uh, to you. Uh, he is the Emmanuel and Robert Hart Director of the Center for Bioethics and the Sidney D. Kaplan Professor of Bioethics at the University of Pennsylvania. He's previously taught at the University of Minnesota, University of Pittsburgh, and Columbia University. He was the Associate Director of the Hastings Center from 1984 to 1987. And he has authored numerous uh, books in all sorts of uh, places, and his most recent publications are Smart Mice Are Not So Smart People. I love that title. Um, his, his art is one of those people who really has looked at a wide range of issues in bioethics. Uh, he's looked at issues in transplantation, in research ethics, in genetics, in reproductive technologies, and health policy, and it's a terrific pleasure to have him join us today. All right. Well, some of you know that I uh, promised to talk about mandates, and there was some uh, pre-meeting announcement that I was going to talk about mandates for parents. But I've thought about it some, and I'm actually going to turn that on its head and talk about a different way to get health care to children, which is trying to get uh, health care workers to get flu shots by mandate. And you'll see how this stands something on its head. Doug spent a lot of time, and I see from the program that there's going to be a lot of time spent on issues of equity and justice, and looking at different uh, moral bases for coming up with uh, rights or entitlements or opportunities to get health care. I'm actually going to, in this talk, play a, a card that isn't played too much in bioethics or medical ethics, and that is notions of obligation and duty. Uh, and I'm going to ground them, as you'll see in a little bit, on uh, professional codes of ethics, which are probably the least tapped source for anybody doing anything in the history of medicine. But I think there's a way here where you can actually uh, get something done. And in fact, uh, I'm here to report that something has been done. And I'll tell you a little about that too. And I do want to thank the uh, organizers of this conference. I, I have to go back uh, partly for a wedding and partly because I'm on duty to raise money for my uh, school um, at a function. And uh, they were nice enough to bring me out here. And I thought it was important enough to come because this is just one great conference. Um, so flu. I'm not talking about just swine flu, all flu. Um, there are a lot of uh, arguments about getting flu vaccination and getting flu shots. You hear them in the public. Some people argue that uh, the flu vaccine isn't particularly effective. Um, what they're saying is that uh, flu, if you're sort of between 18 and 50, generally does not kill you. And so if your measure is of effectiveness, uh, deaths and morbidity, then flu shots don't look uh, or don't come across as useful as some other interventions do. The Cochrane Collaborative, some of you know about that, institution which does meta-analyses of effectiveness um, have argued for a long time that we kind of get too hepped up about flu, but their main measures are morbidity for what they're looking at. So flu is sometimes held to be not that effective, but it doesn't take into account loss of work, physically being sick for a while, and what it does to certain vulnerable populations who score very high in terms of their uh, likelihood of getting very sick or dying. There is some argument that flu vaccine isn't safe, but that's nonsense. It's very, very safe. Um, even swine flu vaccine, which has had uh, allegations of association to Guillain-Barre, there's no uh, evidence that uh, uh, that's so. Um, swine flu is folded into this year's flu vaccine, by the way, that particular strain. Um, I think the safety argument in terms of the data, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, is just not there. So, 
Swine or vaccination against the flu is effective. It does depend on herd immunity. You need rates that are very high to get maximum uh, protection from the flu. It's very effective if you're in a vulnerable population, very young, very old, immune suppressed. Um, it is not just death that we're talking about with effectiveness, but the ability to uh, not be sick and to work. And as I said, safety looks pretty good. Here's some further facts about flu. It kills 3,000 to 49,000 people every year just in the US. The reason that number is so broad um, <laughs> is not the usual epidemiologist hedge. It is uh, because different strains are more deadly than others. So in some years you get a nasty strain, in some years you get a mild strain. And that's why the number bounces around uh, in terms of the number of people killed just in the US. Uh, most of those who are, uh, who die are small children, the elderly and people with chronic illnesses, immune problems. Note that it does cost about 200,000 hospitalizations per year, the flu, even if you don't die. And on the other hand, if you get high rates of flu vaccination, um, you can uh, prevent most of the uh, flu in healthy adults. And if you get high rates of vaccination, uh, in uh, people who are vulnerable, you can prevent most of those deaths. We have good studies, I'm not going through them all here, that show that uh, the more you vaccinate in nursing homes and hospitals, the less people get the flu in those nursing homes and hospitals. So it's one of these kinds of relationships, and there are a lot of studies that show that. So the bottom line in terms of the facts is that flu is deadly, especially among very vulnerable people, including the population that many of you are concerned about here, children and newborns. Flu takes a big toll in terms of hospitalization, but it also takes a big toll in terms of hospitalization of our workforce, and that includes many of you here, doctors, nurses, nurses' aides, pharmacists, and so on. And the flu is effective when you get upwards of 90% plus vaccination rates, and it's very safe. So we would assume given these numbers, that at least one set of people who would be out getting vaccinated would be healthcare workers. Oh, I forgot. Uh, we now have a universal vaccination for flu recommendation out of the ACIP for everyone over six months of age. You can't do it younger than that. No immune response. Um, the only reason we didn't have a universal recommendation for everyone over six months of age in the US and indeed around the world has been that there wasn't enough flu vaccine. So the shortage in supply shaped the recommendation. H1N1 swine flu changed that because a lot of the big pharma vaccine companies geared up to make more flu vaccine. There is enough capacity now, so the recommendation shifted accordingly. It had nothing to do with efficacy and everything to do with supply which is a subject for another day's values discussion, but interesting about how the recommendation trailed the capacity to make the vaccine. So despite these recommendations, here's some very sad news. Healthcare workers have gotten vaccinated uh, who work in hospitals and nursing homes. I don't have numbers for home care or hospice, but those who work in hospitals and nursing homes have remained near 50% for decades in the US. It's just been a number that has not budged, and that is much below herd immunity within those institutions. There are a lot of programs that have been tried for uh, encouraging people to get vaccinated. Some of you will have lived through them, bring the flu shot onto the floor, uh, try and provide incentives, a day off, a trip, that sort of thing if you get vaccination or get the highest number of people vaccinated on your floor jamborees with tapes and all kinds of educational materials, not much works. The rates remain poor. And the rates are poor, I know, among healthcare workers in Britain. I don't know what they look like in other countries by number, but anecdotally, I'm told, they're very poor in Switzerland on the same par, and they are very poor in Japan. I don't know about other places in the world, but I have no reason to think they're any better. This is just uh, post efforts to voluntarily increase vaccine rates in my neck of the woods in Pennsylvania. Those are just some hospitals out there, many of which have lots of kids running around in them. And you can see, even after a push, very little, uh, nobody's getting up on healthcare workers above 
uh, the uh, uh, rates required to really secure herd immunity and to protect vulnerable people in those small hospitals in the eastern part of Pennsylvania. Um, nursing homes and home care programs probably do worse, probably do worse. So why? Why don't healthcare workers get something they think children should get and vulnerable people should get and they could do something very easily? It's not a shortage of supply and I have to say it's not even a shortage of money. So what's going on if the facts bear out the efficacy then why do these rates of flu vaccine stay so low? So we've done some surveys, published them, some of them are in your handout about what people say about why they don't get vaccinated. And they say things that the average person says, interestingly enough. I don't need to get vaccinated because when I'm sick, I stay home. I don't have contact with patients, so I don't need to get them. I don't get the flu. And I can wear a mask, which is an interesting uh, statement because one could, although no one does, but <laughs> one could. That's true. Can't argue that. In terms of... Uh, I stay home when I'm sick. The flu is contagious at least 24 hours before symptoms begin. And many people, including unvaccinated healthcare workers, are carriers and disseminators and vectors. And you certainly can be a carrier and be symptom free. So that one does not hold up. Here's an additional fact, which all of you will appreciate very quickly. The people who say they stay home, really? Healthcare workers, at least in my experience, I'm just an observer, work sick. Or to put it another way, if a resident tells the attending, I don't feel well, I'm staying home, those are not words ever uttered. <laughs> they don't know when they're infectious, but even if they were and they were sick, they're expected to show up for work. A lot of healthcare workers don't get many sick days. So you're not gonna take them just because you feel a little bit sick from the flu. And on my favorite subject of masks, you can wear a mask. A lot of people in Japan wear masks, for example, to prevent the acquisition of disease. You see them in subways and walking around on the streets, the ones that have the holes on the side. <laughs> you can wear a mask if you want to try and prevent the transmission of flu, but you have to change it roughly every two or three hours because as soon as it gets wet, it affords no protection filtering wise or in terms of your exhaling flu virus. So you have to wear it properly, it has to be the right kind of mask and you have to change it all the time. The mask argument is just silliness. It's not practical. So, here we are set up with an interesting issue about access to healthcare to protect newborns, to protect vulnerable people, to protect children with immune disorders, rather than talking a little bit about what to say to parents who won't get their kids vaccinated, what are we gonna say to ourselves? And the facts are pretty clear. It works, it's safe. They try to give it away in the hospital. It's not an issue of money. No big justice question lurking around here. The facts don't work. People aren't motivated, or many people aren't motivated in too many places to do anything about it. So I think what we need is a moral argument that is more compelling that we can add in to this grim situation of under vaccination and the establishment that it is efficacious and it is safe. And indeed, in this country and worldwide, healthcare workers are not in a great position to go out and yell at parents about vaccination if they don't come and say, we're vaccinated. So what are the arguments? Well, if one looks into the codes of ethics of doctors, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, physician assistants, a very interesting fact becomes clear. The first statement in every code of ethics is put patients first. It's even the first moral obligation of pharmaceutical companies in their self-proclaimed ethos statements. Pretty soon in the professional codes of ethics of all professions, you get, come across another self-imposed duty, which is protect the vulnerable and the weak, that we must do this. And my uh, favorite is, of course, our old standby, often cited obliquely in the professional codes, to do no harm. So you can actually find three 
obligations of role, to use a little philosophical jargon. Should I decide to be a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist, a social worker, a respiratory therapist, then I have some duties. And these duties I impose on myself because of the role I am in. And what they tell me is I must protect those who can't protect themselves. I have to put their interests ahead of my interests. And I'm not supposed to do harm. So you've got a tripartite uh, set of obligations and duties. These actually are not forced on anyone. They've been bubbled up from within the professions. Interestingly enough, the duties don't permit exemptions on religious or philosophical grounds. And they, uh, given the harm that you could do to your patients, only health grounds in terms of saying I might die if I took a shot because of an egg allergy or something like that would get you out of the duties uh, that I've just talked about. So the duty to protect the vulnerable. Well, there's the list of the vulnerable babies and young children and the pregnant and the elderly and the immune compromised. They require protection. And interestingly enough, in hospital settings and in nursing home settings, they can't pick their health care provider. It's not like they can say, oh, well, I'm only going to go to a place that has a very high vaccination rate. They wind up where they do. So they don't have a lot of choice, which ups the ante on those caring for them to try and do something to protect them if they are at high risk of death from the flu. Patients first. Well, as I said, all these codes put the idea that patients uh, are first ahead of uh, your own interest. If you want to say, gee, just because I'm a healthcare worker, do I lose some of my liberty to choose and live as I wish? The answer is yes. These duties and roles are inherent in what it means to be a doctor or a nurse. It's just like being a policeman, a soldier, a fire department, or other uh, people who are expected to do certain things because of the job or role they voluntarily assume. We're all familiar with the do no harm principle. Infecting the weak and the vulnerable is to do them the worst sort of harm. If you're not available to work, particularly in a pandemic, it's to do harm. If you feed vaccine fear and anti-vaccine sentiment, which is my link up to your, what do I do with my parents, because you believe that you don't get the flu or you don't need it because you stay home when you're sick or uh, other excuses that I talked to you about earlier, then you're allowing people who believe that they can drink Chinese tea and take vitamins and bathe in eucalyptus leaves to fight off propensity to the flu, you're giving them ammo. Vaccines are a key weapon in patient safety and cutting hospital-based deaths. When you try and figure out why are all these numbers showing up that say so many people die in American hospitals, folded into those figures are infection-acquired deaths, and folded into that figure is flu. This is one of the drivers of why it's not so good to be in the hospital if you're very old or pregnant or a newborn. This is one of those uh, numbers that drives that. So the possibility of doing harm both because you get sick, you infect others, you can't work, and you stink as a role model is pretty high. There are some other people who face mandates, by the way. I just looked around occupationally and role for this. Some of you have been in the military, you know something about the military, you know that uh, informed consent in the military is brief when it comes to vaccination. <laughs> um, if you work on an oil derrick, oil rig, you have to get vaccinated. Astronauts have to get vaccinated. We know that school children face various vaccine mandates. People who work in weapons labs do. And weirdly, immigrants face all kinds of vaccination mandates. So I think there is a clear obligation and duty to get vaccinated on the part of other physicians and other healthcare workers. The leadership of nursing medicine, pharmacy, and so on should be insisting on making vaccination a duty a condition of employment for those who are in these roles. They are not yet, a few groups are. You know here in Washington you had the Virginia Mason fight uh, regarding uh, flu mandates where the nurses union battled a mandate. But in general, leadership, deans and uh, figures in the professional groups are not leading the charge on this. It's a wonderful opportunity, by the way, to pick up press and show the public why vaccination is important. Healthcare institutions, in my view, should be vaccine mandated zones, meaning nursing homes, hospitals, home care programs, and so on, for those who work there, and certainly for those who have patient contact, although it turns out, even if you're working in the building, it would probably be a pretty good idea to get vaccinated. 
And people have a right, I would argue, if we don't impose this kind of a mandate to ask their healthcare worker, have you been vaccinated and I want someone else, although that's a small uh, possibility since most people, as I say, aren't gonna be in situations where they could get a substitute very easily, but certainly it is a question that could, we should be urging uh, those who are especially vulnerable and their relatives to ask of their healthcare workers if we can't get ourselves to do this. Well, that moral argument I gave is one that I took to our hospital, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia first, and then our four other affiliated hospitals. And we began to bring it around to the staff and say, you have a professional duty to do this. After our voluntary efforts at the Children's Hospital didn't get us much above 75% compliance, and our efforts at the hospital, the University of Pennsylvania, and our other three hospitals did not get us much above 60%. We did, in fact, two years ago, institute a mandate. And I've taken this argument out around the country to places, and we have a lot of systems now that are saying, if you work here, you must have a flu shot. And that's some of them there. Uh, I have participated, and there's a paper out from the Infectious Disease Society of America, uh, which called for a mandate in all hospitals and nursing homes of healthcare workers. The American Academy of Pediatrics very recently came out and endorsed this, and so has the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology. Those are good, and that's good leadership, but there's plenty of room for more voices and more organizations to chime in on this. So this is CHOP's experience. We went to the mandate in 2009, but let me tell you, we did not simply say one day, here comes the mandate. What we did was we went around and gave the ethics argument about why there was a duty of role to get vaccinated. By the time we instituted the mandate, there was almost no opposition to the idea that we have a mandate. Uh, I think it's in the folder. One of the papers reporting on the CHOP experience just came out in vaccine. And what people would say is, we'd ask them, do you feel this policy is coercive? And they'd say, yes. And then we'd say, do you feel it's justified? And they'd say, yes. <laughs> so they understand it's coercion to have a mandate but not all forms of coercion are bad. And if you can convince the workforce, not by the facts, because they all knew the facts, they even had fantasies about the facts. I stay home, I don't get sick, whatever little fantasies they have. If you build those facts into a moral or ethical case, then you can move behavior. So we basically said, if you didn't have a health reason, you were gonna get two weeks leave. Remember, this is all after the big educational campaign. And if you didn't uh, get vaccinated after that, you were going to be terminated. And we fired seven people. Now, it turned out the seven people who got fired were not uh, what they thought was that vaccines were made out of pork and pork products. And we could never convince them that that wasn't true. And that turned out to be the battle. It wasn't, I don't get sick or uh, I just have a religious uh, reason. They had a, just a misunderstanding about the manufacture of how these vaccines got made for whatever reason. We could not drill it out of them. We also could have clearly decided to start a policy and say all new employees must get vaccinated and grandfather and everybody else, but we decided to go the tough route and say everybody, new and existing employees. So that's the CHOP experience. Um, we did grant medical exemptions to people with proven allergies and other health conditions. Uh, as I said, nine said no, and uh, actually two did come around eventually, so seven ultimately got fired. That's the vaccine right now, and all new employees have to get flu vaccine. The lessons. You've got to do what I said, which is tell them the facts, but the facts don't work because we've been talking about that with you all forever. It's got to be linked up to the moral obligation of your duty to get a vaccine resting on the three arguments I think that are persuasive. The facts alone have not been sufficient to change behavior. For those of you who are ethicists here, here's an example of ethics actually doing something. <laughs> it's a rare moment. You can bask in it, enjoy it. <laughs> so what's the future? Well, we haven't seen this happen in nursing homes or home care programs yet. There are obviously a lot of people rattling around who aren't bound by the duties of professionalism in hospitals. Are they going to get vaccinated? Well, it turns out that at CHOP, the food handlers and the security people said, if you're going to get vaccinated, then we're going to get vaccinated. So lo and behold, one way to influence the behavior of your parents or the public 
is to do this kind of thing and illustrate it, and others will perhaps be drawn to the idea that this is a good thing to do. If my doctor or nurse does it, then maybe it's something that I should do or get, my, uh, get done for my children. I guess I don't have to worry that it's not safe because if only 50% of you do it, then why should I do it or expose my child to it? Visitors. Well, we don't know what to do with visitors, but we're thinking about going at the Penn hospitals and CHOP to ask that they don't send us any cable guys or flower people who haven't had a flu shot. We can't mandate it, but we, it, once we set it up so that we stand as the example, then we can at least request, we're going to try that. What's going in other countries with mandates is not clear, but there's some interest, I know, in other places in the idea of flu mandate. And should this then be extended to other types of vaccines, if the arguments work, I think it could. But I think the important thing is to set that example for the public. I think that's the crucial uh, lesson here. If we're going to really change behavior with kids, then it's important to change behavior amongst ourselves. So let me stop there and see, just because, as I said, I have to leave. Maybe there's a question or two about uh, the experience that you'd like to ask. I just want to tell people to uh, come down to the, um, we have microphones on this side and that side. There's a question for Dr. Kaplan. Come on down. We've got 15 minutes. Art, you can just moderate from your, yourself there. I've been so for 30 years, and could, could we turn this around to the issue of parent refusal of vaccines? Um, because you talked about not all forms of coercion, coercion, um, coercion are bad, um, and you fired some employees, um, which um, one could argue that that's a form of paternalism. Um, so why does the AAP then say that I, as a practicing pediatrician, can't impose my um, history of 30 years and my medical education, which tells me that I should make good decisions, good clinical decisions based on evidence-based medicine and not uh, because someone believes because of their religion that they can refuse vaccines for their children who are vulnerable. Well, I, I kind of thought we might stumble toward uh, some discussion of <laughs> parents and dealing with families on this. So remember, first of all, you got to clean up your own house. If we're not doing well at vaccinating ourselves, we're not going to be credible when we come out forgetting about the facts and the messages and uh, all the efficacy and so forth and sneering at other people's uh, religious views or fears or whatever. I can tell you the reasons that people give for not getting vaccinated with the flu in the hospital by healthcare professionals are not so dissimilar from what you get on some vaccine refusers out in the world. So we have to address this issue first and be the shining star. That said, I think part of the road to dealing with the fears of uh, parents out there is a, a slightly different angle. I think parents want to do right by their kids. They want to protect them. Some, some people do have religious views about vaccination, but it's a tiny, tiny number. M many people who object to vaccination for their children are very well educated, uh, maybe middle and upper class people. Uh, they watch media, they get messages on the internet about the dangers of vaccine or the non-necessity of vaccine or alternative ways to prevent infection. My view is we keep throwing the facts at them, just as I started to do with you and say, here are the facts. Vaccines are safe, vaccines are efficacious, vaccines work, and you get back a lot of attitude that says, well, you know, I hear all those facts, but I still don't need them. I think we have to acknowledge first that parents are trying to protect and do right by their kids. Their impulse is not to expose them to risk. On the other hand, if you look at risk, it's something that you have to expose your kid to all the time. I try to say to some of my pediatrician friends when they're de dealing with parents who aren't invoking religious reasons, but just nervousness reasons, that many of these parents have a dog. And the kid kisses the dog. Many of these parents let the kid crawl on the floor on a rug, which is full of God only knows what microbial splendor. <laughs> Many of these kids, uh, parents, uh, take them places. They bring them outside. <laughs> it's very dangerous out there. And the point being this, minimal risk is something that you have to deal with as a parent. If you're going to live your life avoiding any risk, then you can't parent. So I would prefer to try and turn the argument about risk around slightly on moral ground and say, I respect 
what you're trying to do. You're trying to keep risk away from your kid, and you think vaccines are dangerous. The facts are that they're very, 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 very safe, and you can see the epidemics going on all around the country when you don't use them. There's a little bit of risk in everything. You know that, but you want your kid to enjoy peanuts or have a shot at a pet or whatever. Maybe we can work together by understanding, I know your impulse to protect, but I think at the same time, you don't do it by being 100% risk avoidant. So in that sense, a shift in the moral norm to try and partner with the parent may get us somewhere. If that doesn't work, then I think we should start to consider tougher mandates. But we're not going to get anywhere on tough mandates if we don't impose them on ourselves and then explain to others that we've done that. So. Great talk. I hope the parents with pets aren't the ones with carpets, because that would be... <laughs> They often go together. More scary, but um, my question is about the uh, nurses whose specific objection was because they had a fixed belief in something that wasn't true, that the vaccines were made using pork products and that this belief was strong enough that they would uh, accept termination rather than some other approach. How, how it's not the, reason I would have expected yeah. from people who would say, you know, I'd expect the risks of the vaccine are high or you have no right to tell me what to do, but to have this weird fixed belief, how did you attempt to overcome this and why was it so hard and was it a specific religion since I'm not aware of, yeah. Yeah, okay. It, it wasn't a specific religion, but it was a specific charismatic guy who had influenced some other folks. And he was just a powerful spokesperson. And we showed them literature on how vaccines are made, and we got a tape from Merck about how, you know, they're in our backyard, so we could show them this is how you make flu vaccine and so on. We gave them a month, and they could counsel and talk to anybody they wanted. They just wouldn't give up on this belief. And at that point, the hospital said, look, um, we, we've really gone the extra mile, but we are serious. You can't work here. It's just a condition of employment. And interestingly enough, because we had laid the groundwork so thoroughly, the union did not back uh, the workers, and the firing went unresponded to. So the ground being laid appropriately had set up a situation where we didn't get a union pushback. So that's why I kept saying making the moral argument in tandem with the facts for over a period of time was very important. You know, in the Virginia Mason case out here, um, for those who don't know, a union fought back against a flu mandate. Um, part of the fight was just about mandates and unions not wanting to take labor mandates. And I understand that. And if you can bring them on board through kind of education to be supportive, I think you can work around that. And I think the CHOP experience with this sort of hardcore we can't dent the belief, and the guy's charismatic was an example of that. I'm not going to tell you it's all, you know, maybe other places you're going to get more pushback. In the places, the hundred places I know now that have moved this way, there has not been a lot of pushback. And as far as I know, there hasn't been more than one or two firings. Some of those hundred are only doing new employees, though, I should say that. I mean, you can just, you know, you can make it from the get-go and not get into the war if you're uh, not so inclined. But it was... They, we tried, couldn't move it. Thank you for your provocative talk. Uh, I'd wonder if you have, could say something about what you might see as the limits of mandates. For example, if we have a duty to protect against influenza, do we have a comparable duty to protect against varicella and require zoster immunization, uh, pertussis? And, and if what we're protecting against is the hazards of influenza, do, does the protecting our patients also imply a duty to get sufficient sleep so that we don't commit errors? What are the limits of this duty? I don't know, but I can tell you this, I'm gonna be exploring them all. <laughs> um, I think it's an interesting direction to head in. So on varicella, maybe. I think on... Uh, DPT boosters, maybe. Uh, we do have it, obviously, in TB. There's a lot of folks telling you to get your nails trimmed. We've had some fights about what clothing you can wear, turbans, neckties, other things that might be infection-associated. I don't know where the limit 
ends on the duty to protect. I suspect it's going to be really triggered partly not just by do, do no harm, but by the vulnerability and the uh, exposure cost for people who really can't look out for themselves. You know, if you're in the bone marrow transplant unit with hand washing and clothing and the steps that are taken there, it gets pretty far along the path toward what you're talking about. But I do think the notion of saying, let's take our duty of role, of obligation, because we are healthcare providers seriously, is one that I would like to see expand out from here and see where that takes us. I don't know, I mean, the limits could be money, the limits could be that herd immunity doesn't matter for some of these things, they're just individual hygiene things. I was in the hospital a couple years ago, uh, and I, it was a short stay for some elective thing, but I stayed overnight, and I was trying to watch infection control who washed their hands. And we had up all the little dispensers and all that stuff, they were in the room and so on, and people would come in and use it, and then go over and touch my bedding, and then touch the uh, machine that was uh, the IV and the monitor, and then go back and touch my bedding, and then go back and touch the monitor, and then touch me, and then wash their hands and leave. That didn't seem to be the right sequence. Um, I mean, maybe good for them, but not so good for me or the next person in the room. Even hand washing and things like that, you look at those safety numbers, you see what we say are our duties of role, in terms of what we proclaim we're gonna do as professionals in the US or worldwide, I think there's work to be done. So I'll, I'll take Doug's, Doug Deacon's solution here. I don't know what the uh, ceiling is, but I'm very interested in exploring the floor a little bit more. I'm Doug Opos, Seattle Children's. Thanks very much for that talk. I, as you were speaking, I, I was reviewing in my head some recent literature that shows that some institutions are using a mandate in a different way. So mandating people who opt out of healthcare workers who opt out of influenza vaccination, vaccination, mandating that they wear masks. And I was thinking that maybe that is an okay solution. It may be perceived as less coercive, maybe just as effective, one, and speaks to this duty as well, and I wanted to hear your yeah, thoughts. I, I looked at the mask issue. I tried to uh, learn about it as much as I could. It, it doesn't seem that it's an alternative. It's partly because people don't wear masks properly. So you gotta really keep it tight on your face at all times, no matter what you're doing. It's very hard not to get it wet, either from you uh, sort of breathing into it or spitting into it, or something happening that gets moisture on it from the outside environment, and that's lethal in terms of viral filtration. It just ruins the mask. You gotta change them very frequently because they do wear out pretty quickly. It's, it's a lot of rigmarole to wear a mask. I wouldn't say impossible to do it, but it's much tougher to really put that into practice than people think it is if you're gonna get uh, protection out of that. So I would say no, it's probably not really a viable option. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a high maintenance uh, requirement on the worker. Yep, I'm missing, yep. there is this pushback from hospital workers and providers against uh, vaccine uh, vaccination. But the flip side is that when we actually talk about the severity of influenza to the point where you need a ventilator, mm -hmm. often, not sometimes, all the time, but often healthcare workers say, well, I should have priority access. So how, um, in your experience, have you come across that? And how do you reconcile that? Because if they just got the vaccine in the first place, their chances of needing the ventilator would obviously be dramatically reduced. So it's a fascinating question. I have seen it a little bit on the allocation of scarce resources, life-saving resources and pandemic. One of the ways I've seen it is um, there's a narrow definition of healthcare worker until you find out that you might get access to a ventilator, in which case all of a sudden everybody wants to be a healthcare worker. Uh, security guards, all kinds of philosophers, ethicists, <laughs> ethics committee people, um, it, it, the ranks grow. So I've seen that happen. But, you know, I, I find myself thinking they don't put the two together. The access to what happens in a pandemic emergency is just disconnected from beliefs about ordinary day-to-day -day affairs and what's going to go on relative to their exposure and to their patients. The, the big obstacle in a certain way is you just don't die if you're a relatively healthy young adult or middle-aged adult from the flu, and so people tend to blow it off, but they aren't thinking about loss to the workforce or infecting others, they're just sort of saying, well, 
it's not going to kill me, so eh, I don't worry about that. So the ventilator brings it home, but it's disassociated, I think, from the, uh, what they think about the flu in ordinary times. That's what the problem is there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Art. Um, before we take a break, a couple of reminders. First, I should have mentioned before, when, during our panel discussions, um, when you come to the microphones, uh, please uh, introduce yourself so the rest of the audience uh, knows who you are. Um, two other quick announcements. Um, in your uh, binders are yellow evaluation forms. We value your feedback, and we really encourage you to uh, complete those evaluations during the course of the conference while your uh, thoughts are still fresh. Um, also, again, we'll remind you that um, the posters are in the sound room. They will be up until 4.30 this afternoon, um, but again, and the, and the attendees will, the presenters will be there from 1 to 1.45, but you're welcome during the breaks to sort of walk by and, and see them as well. Uh, so enjoy the break, and we'll, we will begin promptly back at 10.30. <laughs>